In this video, we're going to develop some ways of seeing coordination complexes that focus on the difference between ligands and counter ions. And we're also going to start digging into the structures of ligands in a little more detail. Recall that ligands are these Lewis basic components of coordination complexes, the typically non-metal, typically organic or organic looking molecules that supply the electrons in the coordinate covalent bond. And first, we're going to talk about coordination spheres, distinguishing between what we'll call the primary coordination sphere and the secondary coordination sphere in a coordination compound. The primary coordination sphere contains the metal center and the ligands that are actually coordinately covalently bonded to the metal center. So for example, here in this cobalt ammonia complex, the primary coordination sphere is enclosed in square brackets and includes the cobalt center and the six ammonia ligands, each of which is bonded to the cobalt center. There are actual coordinate covalent bonds there. These three chlorines, the chlorides, are not part of the primary coordination sphere, but we'll get to those in a second. Now, the number of dative bonds within the primary coordination sphere is referred to as the coordination number of the metal or the complex. So here, for example, we have one, two, three, four, five, six dative bonds between the ammonia ligands and the cobalt-3 center. And so the coordination number of this complex is six. We care about coordination number because this relates to geometry and the steric or spatial environment of the complex and things of this nature. Now, what about those chlorides? How do those fit into the conversation? Well, those chlorides are part of what we call the secondary coordination sphere. The secondary coordination sphere includes counter ions within a coordination compound that are necessary to be there for electrical neutrality, but are not covalently bonded to the metal center. In fact, we can think of these ions in the secondary coordination sphere as essentially involved in ionic bonding with the complex ion itself. So there's an ionic bond between this entire 3 plus cation and the chloride anion, for example. And cations, as the slide says here, are just, quote unquote, electrostatically attracted to the complex ions. So for example, when you take a coordination compound and let's say dissolve it in water, let's say that this, this complex is water soluble, which is highly likely because it's an ionic compound, the three chlorides will dissociate and form just hydrated chloride anions in that solution. But the complex ion will remain intact because of the strength of these cobalt nitrogen dative bonds. The ammonia ligands will by and large remain coordinated to the cobalt center. And this is, again, yet another reason why we care about this difference between primary and secondary coordination sphere. The secondary coordination sphere can be disrupted by solvation, by dissolving a solid coordination compound in a solution. But unless a solvent comes in as a ligand and displaces one of the ligands, the primary coordination sphere is not disrupted when a coordination compound dissolves in water. And we actually think of that as a chemical reaction when a solvent molecule, for example, a water molecule comes in and displaces ammonia. That would be considered a chemical reaction, a ligand substitution process. Speaking of ligands, we're going to take a deeper dive now into the Lewis basic components of coordination complexes, the ligands. Ligands are these Lewis basic atoms, molecules, or ions that donate electron pairs in dative bonds to the metal center. And the electrons donated are most commonly lone pairs. That's likely all you'll see in an introductory chemistry course. However, if you go on to more advanced courses, particularly in inorganic and organometallic chemistry, you'll see pi bonds and even sigma bonds being donated to metal centers as well. But for introductory chemistry, ligands most often bind through lone pairs. And five examples of some common ligands are shown here with those binding lone pairs highlighted. So here's ammonia, water, chloride, the methyl anion which is a very, very strong Lewis base we can think of as a ligand if that carbon is linked to a metal, and carbon monoxide whose carbon has a lone pair that can be donated to the metal center. Carbon monoxide, like cyanide, can also be envisioned as binding through its oxygen, although oxygen being more electronegative is less inclined to uh, serve as a Lewis base than carbon. The specific atom that bears the lone pair that's donated to the metal center is what we'll call the ligand donor 
atoms. So for example, when cyanide binds to a metal center, it typically does so, so through the carbon, and when that carbon is linked to the metal through a dative bond, the carbon is the ligand donor atom. Ligands may have more than one donor atom, and we'll develop some terminology around that here shortly, but just to show one example, a molecule that contains two ammonia-looking nitrogen atoms, two amino nitrogens, can bind in two places, can form two dative bonds to a single metal center. This is ethylene diamine. We'll look at the structure in a little more detail here shortly. And it is what we'll call a bidentate ligand with two binding points on it. Ligands with only one donor atom or that form only one coordinate covalent bond with the metal center are, are called monodentate. And the dentate suffix is kind of meant to invoke teeth, the idea of the ligand biting onto the metal center as sort of a human-friendly metaphor for coordination of a Lewis base to a Lewis acid. Monodentate ligands form only one coordinate covalent bond or bond through only one ligand donor atom in ligands that have multiple donor atoms, which is possible. Ammonia is a great example of a monodentate ligand. Really, the only atom that is Lewis basic in ammonia is the nitrogen, and so it can only bond through one point, through one ligand donor atom, and thus it is a monodentate ligand, kind of by definition, based on its structure. Polydentate ligands form more than one coordinate covalent bond, and these have multiple ligand donor atoms, multiple atoms bearing lone pairs that can be donated to a single metal center simultaneously. And here again, the idea of polydentate evokes the mental image of multiple teeth binding down onto a metal center at the same time. So they have multiple ligand donor atoms, and two examples are shown here. This on the left is ethylene diamine. We looked at that previously. And bipyridine is another important example of a bidentate ligand with two ligand donor atoms, these two nitrogens bearing the lone pairs. And keep in mind, it's these lone pairs that are actually donated to create the dative bonds to the metal center. This slide highlights some important classes of monodentate, bidentate, and polydentate ligands. And rather than go through them in excruciating detail, all I'm going to say is that these are worth studying and worth putting on your crib sheet, particularly those with abbreviations like ethylene diamine, EN. Oxalate is commonly abbreviated as OX, OX. EDTA, which is a hexadentate ligand containing six, as many as six binding points, and so on and, and so forth. A number of the small monodentate ligands are structures you're probably already familiar with, like halide anions, cyanide, ammonia, and water, although some of the more exotic examples, like the azid anion and carbon monoxide, might be worth practicing. The other thing that's worth practicing with these is making sure you can identify where the potential ligand donors are. Right? Why is oxalate considered bidentate? What are the two atoms that are most likely to bind to a metal center? Where is the ligand donor atom in cyanide, in carbon monoxide? And in fact, the ligand donor atom in a number of these is highlighted in red, showing you the electron-rich atom with the lone pair that can be donated to the metal center. Earlier in the video, you may have experienced a little bit of cognitive dissonance when I pulled up Lewis structures for some of these important ligands. For example, this structure of ethylene diamine appears to have two atoms that are unlabeled right here um, that don't really appear to have any identity at all. This is a shorthand structure, and so is this structure. And these are very common in coordination complexes because these organic molecules have a lot of atoms, and showing them all explicitly is often not necessary, particularly hiding carbon and hydrogen is very common. And so I wanted to go through some conventions for drawing organic skeletal structures that you'll, you'll very commonly see in coordination compounds. And the good news is you'll continue to use this as you get to more advanced coursework. These skeletal structures structures are absolutely ubiquitous in organic chemistry. You'll see them every day once you're into your organic chemistry courses. So three ideas for skeletal structures. First, carbon is implied at each intersection of bonds. So where we see two bonds come together, a carbon is located at that intersection. For example, if we back up to ethylene diamine, there's a carbon implied right here, and there's a carbon implied right here because two single bonds are coming together. We've got a bond angle that implies that there is a carbon right there. But that carbon appears to be violating the octet rule, right? It appears to only have two bonds. 
And that's where rule number two comes in. CH bonds are commonly omitted, but we assume that the octet rule is always followed. So that carbon has enough hydrogens to satisfy the octet rule. Again, if we back up to ethylene diamine here, this carbon, for example, has two bonds to H's that are implied so that it satisfies the octet rule. And this is worth pausing and verifying on your own that two additional CH bonds at that carbon would ensure that it satisfies the octet rule. And that is implied in skeletal structures. Methyl groups, CH3 groups, are commonly left out at the ends of lines. This is not something you'll commonly see in introductory courses, but you may see just kind of a hanging line. Keep in mind that to satisfy the octet rule at the end of one of these lines, we need three H's, and this is a methyl group. And so very commonly, you'll just see just the line drawn without a CH3 on the end. Keep in mind there's a methyl group there. All right, so let's look at the example of propane just to get a better handle on this. So propane is CH3, CH2, CH3. It's a linear chain of three carbons with enough H's on each carbon essentially to satisfy the octet rule, right? Eight total electrons around each carbon atom. In a skeletal structure, we would omit the carbons. We would just put these as intersections of bonds and we would omit the hydrogens. So the skeletal structure just looks like this. Keep in mind, there's a CH3 implied here and here, and this is a CH2. Ethylene diamine, we've already talked about in pretty great detail. Here's the full-blown Lewis structure for ethylene diamine with all of the atoms and lone pairs included. If we lose the carbons and we lose the CH bonds, we get to this. And in many cases, you'll actually see the lone pairs on heteroatoms omitted as well, again, based on the idea that the octet rule is always followed. And so heteroatoms nitrogen, oxygen, anything that is not carbon or hydrogen are assumed to have enough lone pairs that they satisfy the octet rule or have any implied formal charge. Formal charge is one thing that absolutely cannot be left out unless we're inside those square brackets of the primary coordination sphere of a coordination complex, in which case if the ligand has net charge, it very commonly won't be shown. 